This is a very long example, but I couldn't resist including it. This is from a, a trial that took place at which I myself interpreted in 1987. Look what happens when interpreting is provided, but the participants forget to allow the interpreter to interpret. Why do they forget? Because they actually understand the language, but somewhere that doesn't understand the language. I'll just read you the passage, even though it'll take a minute or two, and I think you'll see my point. This is the interpreter speaking after she has finally been allowed to interpret for the record. The first remark of Counsel Gill was that in the case of Altman II, there was a similar objection, and the second remark was that Professor Smith herself and Judge Levine, in response to a question on the dimensions of the triangle and the chest in Tuff 149, claimed that under those circumstances she could not, after all, take the measurements in open court, and when it comes to the examination, it must clearly be conducted under better conditions. Perhaps I am jumping the gun, but in my opinion, Mr. Shaked's aim will be to assess the expertise of the witness with regard to those documents, and the decision of the court is, of course, what will indicate to the court that these questions must be stopped without delay immediately in order to ensure that the rules established by the court are not broken. And the witness said, thank you, and I will cooperate with the court. Okay, now what, what do we actually have here? We have the interpreting of four uh, um, pieces of discourse, one after the other, which have not been produced because the participants understood one another, so they got, just kept going. But the interpreter feels that if she doesn't somehow impose herself, you know, insist on interpreting, it won't be in the record. And so this is what she says, more or less at the speed that I just read it now. So this too is a type of interpreting, but the point is that she knows that they understood one another already. So in terms of her scopus, her scopus is just to get it into the record, not necessarily to be understood right here and now. And therefore she rattles it off, and you really can't t tell, you know, who's talking to whom about what. Okay, I'm just trying to show you different situations, again, linked with quality, where we do have it, where we have it but it's unsatisfactory, or where we have it and it's satisfactory, but because of the purpose as perceived by the interpreter, it uh, misfires to some extent. And another example, um, we have here, I'll, I'll do it just very briefly, as you see in bold, the, uh, the judge says, objection overruled, it does not make any sense. And the interpreter says, objection overruled, totally incomprehensible. Now, there's a difference between something not making sense and something being totally incomprehensible. These kinds of things are bound to happen in interpreting, particularly in a pressured situation. And this later led to a situation where the other attorney didn't quite know why he was being overruled, and it has a kind of um, chain effect. Or uh, an example that I think is amusing to those of you who deal with intonation. The interpreter. Now, the attorney has said something in English, and the interpreter is interpreting it into Hebrew, and the back translation is, Your Honor, I believe the court indicated that at the conclusion of her answer, I would be permitted to respond, etc., etc. And then the judge turns to the interpreter and says, I see that not only does Mr. Gill sound angry, but the interpretation sounds angry, too. <laughs> So the interpreter is actually, the judge is actually commenting on the intonation of the interpreter, which was probably an echo of the intonation of the speaker, but somehow is perceived to be inappropriate. And one could have a little discussion here about paralinguistic uh, parameters of interpreting and so on. The judge said it as a kind of a joke, but um, the interpreter was offended. <laughs> Moving on. Does it ever end? The question of how to judge that quality can never, can, how to judge quality can never be answered, it seems, to everybody's satisfaction. An evaluation must be based, maybe based on a sample, but you still need to go over everything. One really bad mistake is all it takes. This is someone talking about the post-editing process. Okay, you've gotten a translation, it's great. Maybe you don't need to go over it. This is a very good translator. The translation looks fine. Let's just hand it over to the client and go for coffee. But then he says, one really bad mistake is all it takes. And even the best translators, as we have been humbled into realizing, even the best of translators can make one really bad mistake, such as, for example, 12th of January, 1986, Dr. Ruth Westheimer, America's most famous sex therapist, announces that a disconcerting error seems to have crept into her first love, Young People's Guide to Sexual Information. The second paragraph on page 195 informed her teenage audience 
that it is safe to have sex the week before and the week during ovulation. Inadvertent omission of the word not forces Warner Brothers, Warner Books, sorry, Warner Books, it could have been Warner Brothers, to recall all 115,000 copies issued since October and to alert translators of its foreign language additions to the oversight. Okay, so as he said, one really bad mistake is all it takes. This is about quality evaluation and about the fact that you can never be 100% sure that you've covered everything you need to cover when it comes to quality. And as Mr. Weaver, the renowned translator, tells us in an interview, once a translation of mine is republished, I never reread it. I know that if I did, I would soon be reaching for a pencil to make further additions and subtractions in the futile pursuit of a non-existent perfection. Is there anyone here who does not identify with this statement? Who translates and does not identify with this statement? I think I would run from bookstore to bookstore just to correct all of the, all of the copies. And moving on to something that has more to do with norms, um, no translation is ever innocent, we are told. Every translation implies a reading, a redefinition under the terms imposed by the translator, who for the occasion usurps the title of author. Here we get into the whole subject of manipulation of literature, of point of view as reflected in or distorted by translation. And this too, as I mentioned earlier, can easily be tied in with a discussion of quality. Sometimes the norm is one that has to do with the subsystem of literature in which you're working. For example, if you're working in non-canonical literature par excellence, and I'll, I'll just bring one example. Those of you who do literary studies have tons of these examples, but I couldn't resist bringing at least one. Ian Fleming, right? Orange juice, coffee, scrambled eggs twice, said Bond briefly. Okay, said the girl, her shoes lethargically scuffed the floor as she sauntered away. The scrambled eggs will be cooked with milk, said Bond, but one can't eat boiled eggs in America. They look so disgusting without their shells mixed up in a teacup the way they do them here. God knows where they learned the trick. From Germany, I suppose. And bad American coffee's the worst in the world, worse even than in England. I suppose they can't do much harm to the orange juice. After all, we are in Florida now. He suddenly felt depressed, okay? That's the, that's the English version. And here's the back translation of the Hebrew version. Orange juice, coffee, eggs, said Bond. Suddenly he felt depressed. <laughs> Let's not bore, us, bore ourselves with the details. Okay? How this ties in with quality, I hope I don't need to explain. And how it ties in with norms, I hope I don't need to explain either. Um, by the same token, Milan Kundera, and many of you probably know this um, essay of his in The Art of the Novel, tells us painfully, in anguish, about the many translations of the joke. It was translation into all languages. But what surprises? In France, the translator rewrote the novel by ornamenting my style. In England, the publisher cut out all the reflective passages, eliminated the musicological chapters, changed the order of the parts, recomposed the novel. Open the book and happen on Helena's monologue. The long sentences that in my original go on for a whole paragraph are at a time broken up into a multitude of short ones. The shock of the joke's translations left a permanent scar on me. Okay, so they, although the previous example was amusing to us, this was not at all amusing to Kundera. And Torah tells us that this kind of, how should we say, scarring of a translation leaves a scar on the author as well, and he certainly would not um, mince words if he were talking about quality. I mentioned in one of my previous talks the uh, use of computers for translating, and in a moment when I give out the handout there's an example there. Um, I'll wait just before that one thing. Um, sorry, I, I jumped the gun a bit. Venuti, of course I could quote Venuti a lot when it comes to uh, norms of translation, but we don't need that. You all know what I'm referring to, but I just brought one sentence. A translation, I insist, needs to be read differently from an original composition, precisely because it is not an original. And I left the um, address of a website on the bottom. Those of you who are not familiar with it, I think you'd enjoy seeing it. Uh, www.wordswithoutborders.org. It's a fascinating website 
which focuses on translated literatures of the world with a particular emphasis on minority literatures, on less well-known literatures. Um, and in it he has, on that website he has a, an essay called How to Read a Translation. And there he speaks a lot about what the quality of translation is if you know that you should be reading a translation differently from the way you read an original composition. So here it's not so much about Kundera's perspective, the author's perspective, but rather the reader's perspective. But now I, I move on to Evan Zohar. Evan Zohar uh, talks about streamlining the process. And he says, I would like to reiterate my measures for assessment of success. Notice that he doesn't speak of quality, he speaks of success of a translation. One is the amount of time, money, and energy actually saved by the program. Now, Evan Zohar, whom we know as a great theoretician, a philosopher of cultures and translation, spends a lot of time and has a website devoted to this topic of how to streamline the process of translation. And shows us that if a piece of text is translated within 20 minutes or less and then revised in the course of two days' work, this can compare with two weeks' alternative. Besides, revising one's own text allows more attention to be given to the text than when translating. Scholars often look down on such practical investigations, he tells us, which I suppose is true. And, he says, but if prompt, pr but prompt, prompt is the software that he uses, you can find it on Google, prompt still fails quite often with idioms and collocations. Okay, so he grants us that for some things, this program is not as good as he would like. Idioms and collocations, which doesn't surprise us all that much. I wish we had some real data based on the analysis of the amount of work invested by professional translators in manual versus computer translation. Unfortunately, no one has undertaken such an investigation. And I must say that I agree with him that it's unfortunate, and I, if there's anyone out here looking for a topic still, I think that to take Evan Zohar's methodology and to do a, a controlled empirical study in which we look to see whether indeed the quality of the final product is the same as or better than the quality of a product by humans, this would be most fascinating. I think I would then suggest that we hide that report deep in a drawer. Uh, we don't really want the world to know, but it would be interesting nevertheless. Especially, of course, if you bring into account such things as time, money, and energy, which you cannot but take into account. And he is really, he's trying to encourage me to get one of my students to do a, a dissertation on this topic. To take a couple of texts and to do, to use prompt and then using speech recognition software to read out the output, to post edit it, and to compare it with what we would get if a similar translated, translated uh, the same text and so on. It's a very interesting question. I mean, uh, Daniel Gilles said that we haven't asked meaningful questions or we haven't come up with meaningful results. Well, I don't want to get into an argument with all of that, although I could, but let's say that this would be one example with which I would say this would be a meaningful result. I may not like the result, but it certainly would be a meaningful result because it has far-reaching social and economic and practical implications. And, of course, using a corpus to evaluate translations. I mentioned that already, so I'll skip it. I'm going, before I talk about quality and interpreting, which is a whole other topic, I think I'll pause and give out the handout, because we don't have that much time. And either I'll get to interpreting or not, but I'd like to show you the handouts. So, time out. I just put together a few things that I wanted to use by way of illustration. First of all, I... I um, the first three pages, which we're not going to actually read, I'll just explain them. First three pages, as you see, are evaluations of translations. Uh, in one of my many hats, I um, serve as an evaluator of translations for the Israeli, what's it called, the Institute for the Translation of Hebrew Literature, which basically means if they're going to translate a book and they're going to invest a lot of money in a translator, they first send it out to the translator to do a few pages. And then they send it to me to evaluate. Um, and I never know who the translator is. It really is anonymous, and of course the translator certainly doesn't know 
who is evaluating the work. It's strictly anonymous. Sometimes I discover years later who the person was, but it's really anonymous. And it's an awesome task because basically, you know, often I say, who am I to decide if this is not, if this is a good translation or not a good translation? But someone has to decide. They haven't yet worked out the software that's going to make that decision. And when I look back, because I keep these evaluations, and I look at the kinds of things that go into such an evaluation, I see how horribly subjective it really is, but I haven't figured out a better system. We're, not, we're certainly not going to read this, and most of it isn't that important, but if you, if you look um, on the fir at the first one, uh, you see by the words in the first paragraph, the evaluator is speaking about the breathlessness of the passage and success in recreating something and the frenetic atmosphere and stream of consciousness associations. In other words, it's really a kind of textual analysis. And then I go on to say, I would not hesitate to commission the translation from this translator who has a wonderful command of register and so on. Now this is so impressionistic. But quality evaluation is often impressionistic. That's why I brought it, because I'm talking about corpori and about computers and about um, statistics and about empirical work. Well, very often it's impressionistic. And as you see in the last paragraph on the first page, the examples above are few and unimportant. The translation reads well and falls nicely into the patterns and the tone of the Hebrew. As noted above, this translation, the translator is well qualified to translate, to render this text into English. Now, why are the examples few and unimportant? If the person made mistakes, they made mistakes. But at some point, you intuitively decide, okay, in a less than perfect world, five mistakes isn't that important. Let's commission the translation from this person. If you turn the page, the evaluator had, has had the audacity to illustrate by rewriting part of the translation and saying at the very bottom, no, at the very top, the translation is adequate, no misunderstandings, no blatant errors, but rather stiff. So it's all about impressionism again. And again, I'm not going to read the whole thing aloud, it's not that important, but it's all about the evaluator's impression of the translation. And in a sense, this is all they have to go by until they figure out a better system for quality assurance in translation. And at the very bottom it says, in sum, the translation is adequate and error-free, but somewhat stodgy. Now what do you do with that? Do you commission a translation from someone who is adequate and error-free, but somewhat stodgy? Damned if you do, damned if you don't. I suppose you ask for the next person to try to do it and hope that it's less stodgy, but maybe it won't be error-free. Who knows? And then there's a translation of poetry. Now, I almost never get to ask, thank goodness, to evaluate translations of poetry. It's a thankless task. But, again, if you look at the very last paragraph, the translator has done a reasonably good job with all these uh, challenging poems and has undoubtedly paid meticulous attention to detail, but the net result loses much of the process. And so on. So, impressionism, impressionism. I'm saying this as a kind of um, mea culpa, as a kind of um, statement, as a kind of question to you, perhaps. What are the alternatives? How else, if you, were, if you had a small budget with which to commission translations of your national literature and you wanted to sell it to the world but you could only commission X number of translations per year. And like the article about the Hungarian author who killed the first, I mean the, the Hungarian translator who kind of killed the first novel that he translated and no other novel has ever been translated by that author again. You don't want to repeat that experience. You tell me, what are the alternatives? Are there any alternatives? Silence in the hall. Yes? yes? If we are talking about literary translations, do we need alternatives? Isn't it about impressions? That's what I'm wondering too. Um, I would say that you're right. I would say that we, whether we need them or not, there is no alternative except to commission someone who knows both languages well and has some experience um, and hope that they know what they're talking about. Um, but it would be nice, you know, I mean, in this age of uh, empiricism, it would be nice if we could do better than, well, Schlesinger says it sounds stodgy. So what? Okay? Um, but there it is. Do we need alternatives? 
I would hope not, but I mean, even if we do, I can't think of one. So I'm just kind of echoing your question. Let us turn the page. And here we have the, uh, the translation, the typical translation of the first page of an article by Evan Zohar, which he fed into a piece of software called Prompt, and which he swears by, because he says that he then went through it. The English is the translation, as you see. You can see by the brackets. And it's not bad, but what he says is, I now have an English translation. It took the computer two minutes to produce it. I will now read it aloud into my computer. It will appear on my screen. As I read it aloud, I'll clean it up. If, for example, the computer gives me two words, I'll decide as I read which of the two words is more appropriate. Here and there, I'll fix the syntax. Afterwards, I'll print out what I have on my screen, and I'll go over it with a pen. It'll take me two days but I'll still have done it much faster and, he says, better than if I were to sit down and translate it from scratch. It's arguable, but it's an interesting proposition. So I just brought you a sample of it since I've mentioned it a few times. And if anyone wants to do some research on it, that would be great. Now I stop for a moment with the handout and go back to the um, PowerPoint because uh, it's about interpreting. So, interpreting, just as I said, there's a massive amount about quality in translation. There's also a massive amount about quality in interpreting. And I just brought, you know, a quote by each of, each of those who speaks about it, or not each of them, but a few people speak.